Today on Rainbow Country, Altered Carbon Season 2. From the hit Netflix series, award-winning actor Torben Liebrecht, plus award-winning, best-selling author Kim Taylor Blakemore talks about her latest novel, The Companion. Stay tuned for Gay Talk Radio right here on Rainbow Country. Hi, I'm Garrett Conley, author of Boy Erased, a memoir. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara on CIUT 89.5 FM. Well, hello, and welcome to another episode of Rainbow Country. As I like to call it, a little gay radio show working to give voice to the LGBT community and beyond. As always, I am your tour guide through Rainbow Country, a Mark Tara. So, this is episode 189. Today, they say she's a murderess. She claims she's innocent. But Lucy has been known to tell lies. The Companion from best-selling, award-winning author Kim Taylor Blakemore talks about her latest novel that's set in 1855 New Hampshire and tells a story of lies, murder, has LGBT representation, and has four out of five stars on Amazon.com. Plus, Altered Carbon Season 2, one of the stars of the hit Netflix series, joins me to talk about all things carbon. Award-winning actor, Torben Liebrecht. But up first, author, Kim Taylor Blakemore. Count the bodies. One, two, three if we count Mary Dawson. Four if we count my Ned who breathed and suckled three days and nights before succumbing to the ague. All blamed on me. It is cold here, the last of winter, Wednesday, I think. Matron has brought another blanket, but not lit the stove. Fingers of cold claw my collar. The mist cuts my lungs. Knives of ice. Mary Dawson died in winter. Maybe Mary should be blamed. She was found face down in a frozen brook on her way home from the Burtons after finishing the laundry and washing up. The men chipped her out of the ice, carried her like a board on their shoulders, her overcoat and skirts frozen in the patterns of the water's ripples and flows. It was to be her last day at the great house. She had been promised to Thomas Rogers in Peterborough. He was a cooper, though that has no bearing on her unhappy death. I've heard she was a fine character. She gave her wages to her family and was deemed good-natured. People called her sweet and helpful and cheerful. Drop those words in a pot and stir, and they might congeal into the word thick. Cook called me rude when I said that, though she did not deny it. Mary Dawson was nothing to me then but a story. She was dead, and the Burtons required a maid. It was deep winter. The snow banked against the trunks and limbs of bare trees. It cracked under my boots, clicked and rattled in my hair. It rested in the seams of brick on the great house before me. The oil lamps flanking the wide stone staircase hissed and fluttered. They lit nothing, their glow meek in the purpling afternoon light. The curtains were closed on the tall windows, and the only sign of life came orange and warm through the thin slits of fabric. I was not meant to call there. I was meant for the back entrance. She is a best-selling, award-winning author. She is Kim Taylor Blakemore. Hi, how are you? I am great. How are you? I am good. First of all, thank you for being here on the show to have your voice, your story be heard by the LGBT community and beyond. So thank you so much for that. Absolutely my honor. Okay. Kim Taylor Blakemore, let's start here. The Companion, 
set in 1855, uh, talks, talks about lies, talks about murder, has LGBT representation. You are the author. You wrote this book. What is this book all about? I think that the book is a lot about how lies can catch up to you. Uh, if you look at a big level about that, um, I'm really love that idea of lies and secrets. Um, and I'm a big Daphne Du Maurier fan. So that's like her thing. Um, I really love the idea of looking at ante the antebellum world, uh, the break before the Civil War, and particularly in New England, I think it's a really remarkable era, and I love that it has... If you Have you been to New Hampshire? I have not. It is this incredibly beautiful area that is so rural, and it just draws to it, in my mind, these great sort of gothic ideas. And um, that's really where uh, the book story started to form was when I went there and looked at the area and said, this is great. It's like this isolated place where everybody is isolated from each other from the out I guess what I would call the outside world, the progressive world of Boston and New York. And um it's just a it's a really good area to play with Gothic. So the companion is set in eighteen fifty five. Why why eighteen fifty five? That's an excellent question. And that actually related to my research into capital punishment in New Hampshire at the time. When I was writing the story, um, the, the timeline between uh, the conviction of Lucy Blunt and her possible hanging had to be very short, um, just in terms of the story structure. I needed it to be just a few months in there. And in New Hampshire, right after that year, they changed the, the laws for capital punishment, where the time between the conviction and the execution became a year. So, that it, so it was literally based on when's the last time I can have that short of a um, timeline between a conviction and an execution. So is this novel, is this a work of fiction? Is it based on true stories? Is it a fictionalized telling of true events? It's actually a fictional story. But as I was doing the research on the story, I found a real murderess from the same area in the same prison at the same time. And that was fascinating to follow. Her name was Letitia Blaisdell. And she was in prison for killing her adoptive brother, mother, and attempting to murder her adoptive father and her grandmother because she wanted the deed to the family farm. And she had been a mill worker, a fallen mill girl, and couldn't make it on her own. So that was her decision. I'm going to kill the rest of the family and try and get the deed. So she was in the prison at the same time as my character. And uh, she has a small part in the book, tiny, tiny. So let's talk about two characters in the novel, your your main character, Lucy, and Eugenia. Eugenie? Mm. Yes, Eugenie. Their relationship, how would you describe their relationship? Well, I think that they are both feel like they are outsiders. And I think that they end up, with, at least as I wrote it, that they end up really seeing each other and very much bond together. Um, I really, it was really important to me with Eugenie that I built her, she's blind in the story. My background is in orientation and mobility for the blind. So I used to 
teach a lot uh, of adults, particularly. And I always found that in fiction, people who were blind in stories were used kind of as plot points or, oh, it's the blind, really wise person. And I, I didn't want that. I wanted to see someone finally in a story who was blind, but that was only a facet of their character. So that was very important to me with Eugenie. She also, in the story, is very manipulative of everybody. She seems like she's helpless, but she actually has manipulated almost everybody in that household. That's how I see it as the author. Um, but then she's also extremely lonely uh, in the, this mill town in the middle of nowhere. And she, I, I really love that she, um, she and Lucy just, I don't know, they look at each other at one point and realize you're nothing like I thought you were going to be. I think that they say that to each other at one point and really um, bond after that, fall in love. Is it important for you to have LGBT representation in your novels, in your work? I certainly did in this novel. That was very important. And if you go back to uh, a middle grade book that I wrote, Sissy Funk, there's LGBT representation in that novel, too. Uh, the aunt in that is a uh, lesbian, and her lover is a jazz singer. So, yes, it's not in every single novel, but in this novel particularly, it was really important to me. And I, it naturally grew out of Lucy and how Lucy uh, related to people, and that she found someone safe within Eugenie, apparently. Do you find that in the writing process that your characters take on a life of their own and maybe speak to you as your as the story is unfolding yes absolutely i when i tend to begin a novel i'm really looking at the voice of the main character and lucy came across really really strong um i wasn't even going to write her i was writing about a female jazz band at a at a writing retreat. And I was all ready to write about that. And the first prompt came out and Lucy came pouring out. So she really drove the story. And when I plot, I tend to just, once I get the voice of the character, I will then kind of see what the ending is in my head and write something to get to. And then in between, those characters really start taking over the story. And if I find that I am Forcing the story, and, and particularly this happened in The Companion, and it probably makes me seem like kind of nutty, but I was so happy about a scene I had thought through and set up, and it was all set at this time with the, the everybody sitting at a table and the master of the house giving an orange to everyone, and Lucy whispered in my ear, that never happened, and stopped me. And I was like, okay. You tell the story. So, yeah, the characters take over. I love when they do that. They have much more um, interesting things to do than I can think of. So The Companion is out as an audiobook, is that correct? Yes, it is. And whose decision was that? Was that you as the author? Um, I'm with Lake Union Publishing, so they were the ones who chose what it was going to be in. So it was Hardback, ebook, paper book, and audible. And who's doing the narration in the e in the audiobook? The narrator is a amazing actress called her name is Anne Etter. And she short story on her. She uh I had actually met her on Facebook at one time when I was looking for research on New Hampshire. And she a few years ago, introduced me to her father, who was a local historian in the area where my book was set. So I, when I traveled to New Hampshire to finish up research, he and I met. We went all around southwest New Hampshire looking at uh, different historical things. And then when the Audible book was going to be recorded, the producer 
got in touch with me with some different names and different actresses to listen to. And I was like, wait a minute, Anne is a audible narrator. So I called her and I said, hey, what do you think about auditioning for this? And she said, okay, I will. And I was so excited when the producer and director picked her because she grew up in the same area. So you are a history nerd, a gothic novel lover. <laughs> do do those two things make you, Kim Taylor Blakemore, a better writer? Well, <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Uh, I, I think when I, I love history, I love going to historical societies. Wherever I go, I'll find one. I'll find an old historic house. Um, I'm really looking for details, small things that you can put in to a scene so a reader really feels dropped in a story, not like getting this big inundation of information of history. So I love that. Um, and Gothic novels, there's just so amazing, great old Gothic novels, new ones. Laura Purcell is amazing. She's an amazing Gothic novelist. And so I try and learn from their styles and the different styles they have. So I think both of those things go together. Unfortunately, when I go places, I'm like, oh, I think I, you could do a really good murder right back there. And my friends are like, could you stop for a minute with the murder thing? Let's just stick at the quilts. So does being a veteran saber fencer make you a better writer? That's a really good question. And that one, I would say absolutely, because in fencing, it's all about discipline. And I think when you write a novel, at least to me, it's about discipline. It's sitting down each day that you said you would sit down for the amount of hours and writing the amount of words you want per day. And those two things really uh, relate to me. So you are a female writer. You are a member of the LGBT community. You have you have LGBT representation in some of your novels. How challenging has it been for you as a writer to get some of your works published because of the content? Has that sometimes been a challenge for you? That has not been a challenge for me. So... I, I think I've been pretty lucky that way. So it sounds like you tend to get a lot of inspiration from your surroundings. Would that be correct? Absolutely. Yeah, setting is the crux to me of, of story, to get to really ground the story. And so the spark for The Companion came from where? The spark for The Companion came from a uh, sort of... I, I would call it a dream, but it was a waking one. And it's generally when I'm starting to figure out new stories and I'll just let my brain do what it does. And it was started with an image of a woman in a prison cell. And there was a very, very high window and a slice of white light through it, but it was extremely cold. And she was sitting in the chair looking at that window. And then the line came stories move in circles. And I started writing from there. That line's not in it, but it does drive the story because her story is a bunch of circles that uh, intersect but don't always agree. So yeah, I generally, in most of my things come from one central image, almost like a piece of a film. And then I'll drag them from there into see if they're going to be a good story to tell. So, Kim, before I let you go, three quick questions. Are you ready? I'm, I'm ready. Okay. Red or white? Red. Day or night? Night. Typing or handwritten? Ooh, handwritten. Kim Taylor Blakemore, fantastic. How can people find out more about you and your, your novels and your writings? How can they do that? That's fantastic to ask that. Uh, you can go to my website at 
www.kimtaylorblakemore.com. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook at kimtaylorblakemore.com. And what's coming up next for you for the rest of 2020? Uh, I just turned in the edits for my next historical thriller that's coming out next January. Just turned that in on Friday. And I'm starting book three for Lake Union, the third historical thriller. So that's going to be most of my year doing that and traveling around and talking to readers about the companion. Fantastic. Kim Taylor Blakemore, thank you so much for your time and congrats on the book. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. The Companion by Kim Taylor Blakemore. Performed by Anne Etter. Count the bodies. One, two, three if we count Mary Dawson. Four if we count my Ned, who breathed and suckled three days and nights before succumbing to the ague. All blamed on me. It is cold here. The last of winter. Wednesday, I think. Matron has brought another blanket, but not lit the stove. Fingers of cold claw my collar. The mist cuts my lungs. Nice of ice. Mary Dawson died in winter. Maybe Mary should be blamed. She was found face down in a frozen brook on her way home from the Burtons after finishing the laundry and washing up. The men chipped her out of the ice, carried her like a board on their shoulders, her overcoat and skirts frozen in the patterns of the water's ripples and flows. It was to be her last day at the great house. She had been promised to Thomas Rogers in Peterborough. He was a cooper, though that has no bearing on her unhappy death. I've heard she was a fine character. She gave her wages to her family and was deemed good-natured. People called her sweet and helpful and cheerful. Drop those words in a pot and stir, and they might congeal into the word thick. Cook called me rude when I said that, though she did not deny it. Mary Dawson was nothing to me then but a story. She was dead, and the Burtons required a maid. It was deep winter. The snow banked against the trunks and limbs of bare trees. It cracked under my boots, clicked and rattled in my hair. It rested in the seams of brick on the great house before me. The oil lamps flanking the wide stone staircase hissed and fluttered. They lit nothing, their glow meek in the purpling afternoon light. The curtains were closed on the tall windows, and the only sign of life came orange and warm through the thin slits of fabric. I was not meant to call there. I was meant for the back entrance. Hi, I'm Joey Lamar, best-selling author of Mambo Lips and Salsa Hips, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara on CIUT 89.5 FM. Bill 7. To ban discrimination in employment, government services, and housing, based on a person's sexual orientation, was up for a vote at Queen's Park. Most NDP and Liberal MPPs supported the bill, but without some progressive conservative legislators' backing, a divisive split could rack the province. Four PCs decided to break party ranks to vote with their conscience and support Bill 7. Cabinet Minister and MPP Dennis Timbrell did it to show solidarity for his beloved brother, the well-known drag queen, Rusty Ryan. And for me, a gay politician who was not yet out, I had to take a stand. We were known as the Gang of Four. I'm former Cabinet Minister and MPP Phil Gillies. The date, December 2nd, 1986, when LGBT rights came to Ontario. Hi there, I'm Glenn Dixon, and you're listening to CIUT 89.5 FM. The Companion 
by award-winning best-selling author Kim Taylor Blakemore is out now wherever you get your favorite books or audiobooks. Plus, four out of five stars on Amazon.com ain't too bad. After 250 years on ice, a prisoner returns to life in a new body. Set in a future where consciousness is digitized and stored. Altered Carbon Season 2 drops globally Thursday, February 27th in 190 countries. Season 2 stars Anthony Mackie and my next guest, award-winning actor Torben Liebrecht. I crossed the stars in a colony ship before stacks were invented. I left a dying Earth behind to see the new world. Mr. Kovach. I know what you dream of. Your resleeving is now complete. This work designed by Kamalo Bioware. Military use only. Rapid healing, enhanced reaction time, among other bells and whistles. Oh my. Of all the godforsaken rocks we've been to, we're right back where we started. Harlan's War? I thought you swore you'd never return. What compelled you? I'm still looking for her, and I can't walk away. That's not love. It's obsession. In time, even love turns to dust. Chuck. Whatever you need, whatever it costs, cut out their stacks and bring them to me. The whole planet's going to be hunting him. We're in danger here. Oh, I assure you. Measures will be taken. I can destroy you so utterly nothing will be left. I've heard that one before. Activate Evergreen. Confirm. Are you so far gone you don't recognize yourself? How does it feel to be afraid of death again? Or is this your first time? He is an award-winning actor. He is Torben Liebrecht. Hi, how are you? Hi, good. How are you today? I am well. I am even better now that I am speaking to you. Before we go any further, (laughs) before we go any further, I want to say, first of all, thank you for talking to me to have your voice and your story be heard by the LGBT community and beyond. So thank you for that. Oh, for sure. And Pleasure. Thank you for having me. And as well, I want to say this to you before we get going. Yeah. Ich kann ein bisschen Odorska sprechen. Wow. Sehr gut. <laughs> Nicht schlecht, mein lieber Herr Gesangsverein. Very good. And I have one wow. more. <laughs> I have one yeah. more. I have one yeah. more. Wo ist das Wasserklasset? <laughs> <laughs> Wo ist die Toilette? Yeah. <laughs> it's very good. It always is always good to know to know uh, some words in, in another language. Like in Spanish, I can say like um, um, I'm freezing and I'm a peach. Tengo frío y soy Or in in Brazilian, I can say like. Um, I don't speak a single word of Portuguese, but I can make a one hell of a fruit salad with, <laughs> uh, with mango and, uh, and pineapple, I think it was. Wow, aren't we special? It's an, it's an icebreaker. It's an icebreaker. Yeah. Right? So, Altered Carbon Season 2 comes out on February 27th on Netflix. You star in this season. Torben, how would you describe Altered Carbon, the series? How would you describe this series? 
how would I describe, I describe the series? Um, well, first of all, it has a very interesting pr- premise. It's a sci-fi show. It's, um, it's a cyberpunk show that is set in uh, in a future where the human consciousness can be uh, digitized and transferred. Um, bodies become interchangeable, and as a final result, death is no longer uh, permanent, and that is a very, very interesting uh, premise for a show, which um, allows a lot of entertaining plot lines. What I, lo- what I love about it so much is that, on the one hand, you know, you got all the ingredients that you need for something that is really cinematic and gripping. You got this incredible world building um, that's happening there. You got badass characters, but on the other hand, you have this underlying philosophical depth to this question of what will happen to us as a society once we're uh, provided with a technology that would allow us to like digitize and transfer our conscience, which means that death will no longer be be uh, yeah. permanent. Um, we have diversity in the cast goes um, across race, age. Um, Sex and everything. And I think it's um, if you if you're somebody who's interested just purely in sci-fi and who likes to be entertained by by action, you, you can find something in the show and and you're in for a treat. But you, if you're in it for uh, the emotional roller coaster ride, um, you're more than welcome to jump on board. And the great thing about the second season is um, you don't really need to know season one to have fun and enjoy while you watch it. But if you've seen Season one, like you told me, you've seen before. Um, oh gosh, you're in for a treat. You'll be so rewarded. So, in season two, you play Colonel Ivan Carrera. Tell me about this character. What is this character all about? Uh, so, Ivan Carrera is what you would call a soldier's soldier. He is the leader of a military special forces unit of the Protectorate, which would be something you could compare to the United Nations here. Um, and he is deployed to the planet of Harlan's world, where our season is set in order to uh, overview and uh, overview all military aspects um, of things that are happening there. He is a very dogged person. Somebody has a very, very high um, ethics, and he is on the hunt for season's protagonist, or the show's protagonist, um, Takeshi Kovac, and uh, he does so rather, let's say, relentlessly, without giving away too much. So was this season, was this character in season one, or is this new to season two, your character? The character is new to season two. You play a colonel, and did you have to do any special training leading up to filming? Well, especially tri- uh, we had to prepare for it, or, or I had to prepare for the part, and I wanted to prepare for the part because I felt that um, with all the level of uh, high demands that there are physically in, in, in this world and also for a character that comes from a special operations background, I uh, put in a lot of work into training so that meant physical preparation by you know changing the diet, doing two workouts a day um, for a couple of months, and also working closely with uh, some of the some of the greatest stunt uh, coordinators and stunt performers in the industry. Now, just getting to pick their brains was, uh, was was amazing. Spent some time with them and got to learn a lot from them. I, I had a little background in, in martial arts, but it's something else. If you do something just you know for the sake of defending yourself, um, it, it's different than when you do something that has to look good on com- camera. And I, I really got to got a lot of great input from the guys who go there inside the project. So Altered Carbon is a real sci-fi tour de force, an epic tale, lots of visual effects. Did you have a challenge in regards to acting when it came to the visual effect aspect of the series? Was it challenging for you in any way? No, not 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 really. Because the great thing about being on the show is that um, most of the sets, uh, I'd say much more than o- over ninety percent, 
um, is 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 really built from scratch and it's there and it and exists in reality. Uh, the, the amount of green screen and acting that I had to do was uh, so little compared to what we shot in the real sets that have been built beautifully uh, built by our production designer uh, Carrie Meyer. It really it, it's it it, it it was really there was were hardly any challenges where I had to imagine something. Uh, or, or make something up in my fantasy that that wasn't there for me uh, visually or haptically. So I could everything was 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 tangible, you know. And where did you guys film? Um, we were in Vancouver. Mm. We filmed in Vancouver um, for almost six months, with a, a lot of stuff being filmed in the in the big big soundstage that uh, Skydance has, and. Uh, there were also the exterior shots uh, were also done in uh, British Columbia, which is quite a quite a, quite a no brainer given the given the beauty of the nature. So I'm curious to know how did this role of Colonel Ivan Carrera? How did this role come to you? Was this something that you auditioned for? Is it something that you you sought out? How did you end up with this great role? I ended up with this great role because um, my manager back then um, discovered the description for the part online and within one hour pitched my material and pitched pitched me to the casting director and they invited me to do a self-tape. So um, what I did was I invited over a friend who is a bit of my lucky charm, to be honest, because I recorded a self-tape with him that uh, that got me on X Company before, on CBC, for three seasons. And uh, I recorded the self-tape with him, and I ended up getting an offer after a couple of weeks of being patient, patiently waiting and hoping, because I, I love the show so very, very much. And um, when I was um, in L.A. over winter time, I got the call, and uh, yeah, they told me that I had the part. And I just couldn't believe uh couldn't 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 believe it yeah you just mentioned x company in 2016 at the canadian screen awards was it best actor or best supporting actor that you won your award for it was best supporting actor in a in a tvc yeah did you always want to be an actor growing up well i think when i when i grew up the first thing i wanted to be were things like you know some people want to become policemen. I wanted to be Batman or wanted to be James Bond or, you know, wh- whoever was the, the, the sort of hero. I, I, I grew up in front of the television. I, I, I watched a lot of American television when I was a kid. And at one point I realized that those characters are being portrayed by actors. And that kind of triggered my desire to become an actor myself. That's how it initially started. Now, I um I find myself in one of my favorite programs, so that is amazing. And it's also been, you know, a fair amount of luck to be at the same at the at the right spot at the right time, being seen by the right people, and to be given given the chance to to shine and given the opportunity to shine. And coming back to X Company, X Company was one of those those um, experiences that allowed me to shine, where I was constantly being challenged in the most positive way by our showrunners, um, Stephanie Morgenstern and Mark Ellis, who would feed me with great storylines and um, allowed me to portray a character that was so ambiguous in a, in a very, um, you know, fearless way. Was um, Together with with uh, Otto Carbon, one of them, yeah, one of the most important uh, working experiences I, I, I've had. So did you see that award as validation going back to when you were a kid? Wanting to be a f- like fantasy characters, wanting to get into acting. Did you see this as validation that you are doing what you were meant to do? I don't know if I see it as some sort of validation. It was just something that happened. You know, I'd also been working in Germany for quite some time, and you know, being 
being awarded with something even in, in North America, in a country that is so far away, uh, was something that just felt otherworldly to me. I remember when I was sitting there on this table, and I think um, during the ceremony, my award was category number 52. Oh or so that night, like we were sitting there for hours on the table, and suddenly they were calling out my name. It was all feeling so unreal. And I just felt beyond happy and, and, and grateful and thankful that I could share my thanks on a public stage my, and, 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 and say thank you to, to all those people that made that possible. It was like a, like a dream come true, and it, it showed me that it was worth um, you know, being and remaining persistent during times where, as an actor, you may also face um, face a crisis professionally you know it's, it's, I mean our profession is we're, we're requested to be um, vulnerable all the time you know in, in the face of constantly possible rejection and um, if you try to be emotionally permeable and, and this is seen and it is rewarded it is yeah, it, it, it was something that, that meant a lot to me and that installed, reinstalled some, some, some faith and uh, courage for myself. Yeah. Well said. You perform on stage, you perform on screen, behind the camera, directing, in front of the camera. Where does Torben Liebrecht, where do you feel most comfortable doing what? I feel most comfortable. Um, around the whole playground. You know, I don't just want to be sitting on the swing or on the seesaw. You know, I, I, I want the whole playground for myself, if that's possible. That's that's where I get to enjoy things, things most. Whenever I get the chance to do something that is meaningful for myself, you know, where I see that it has a purpose, that a character is important, whether I play it or whether I, I can write it and direct another actor portraying that character. That's what what feels most rewarding for me whenever I get to work with my instincts, question my instincts. And um, sometimes it happens, mostly it happens in front of a camera at the moment more than, than, than behind it. But, you know, who knows what the future uh, holds in store. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious. And I feel like a little boy on a playground. And um, I enjoy myself. And I enjoy playing with other fellow curious people in that field and I feel very very blessed that I'm uh, I'm allowed to stay on this playground as long as I possibly want without anybody calling me uh, calling me in because it's getting dark I have to go to bed or go to school tomorrow you know so Torben how can people find out more about you online on socials that sort of thing how can they do that I am on Instagram mostly so this is where I work that's kind of the platform where I share um, where I share most of most most of the stuff. I initially started out after I hadn't been on social media for a very very long time. I came um, I came back on Twitter to um, see how people were reacting to um, X company, and then at one point um, at one point um, I switched to switched to Instagram. So that's where I am. I don't post every day or not not twice a day. I only feel that I want to post whenever there's something interesting that I have to share. There are a couple of interesting things and behind the scenes, uh, things that will come up, especially now for the second season of Alta Carbon coming out on uh, this Thursday on the 27th. It's going to drop in 190 countries. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to see what's going to happen to my account and where all, like, all the demographically, where all the followers will come from. Mm. And, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to feed them interesting interesting uh, and funny little anecdote from, from six months. So what's coming up next for Torben Liebrecht? Uh, well, what's coming up next? Uh, what's coming up next is I'm, I'm going to do a TV movie uh, back in Germany now. That's, uh, that's the first thing that's going to happen and everything that's going to happen afterwards is, is in the realm of where I wouldn't want to jinx it right now by talking about it if the you know if the ink is not dry. But uh, um, I'm I'm also very very curious to see what's what's happening um, 
once the show comes out. And I'm I'm very, very grateful for being able to um, present myself to a worldwide audience with such a complex character in such a beautifully written and conceived universe um, that is, as I said, entertaining and also on the other side as, as deep and psychologically rewarding as uh, the Alter Carbon universe. So, Torben, before I let you go, three quick questions. Are you ready? All right. Are you nervous? Is that question number one? <laughs> no, no, I'm just asking. I'm not nervous. I'm curious what you're coming up with. So okay. Me, up. okay, three quick questions. Here we go. Yeah. Red or white? Red or white? Um, I have to say transparent. My weapon of choice is water. So if it's about if it's about drinking habits. Day or night? Um it's 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 a tough one. Um I like both of it early, going to bed early and getting up early. That's what I like. But I don't have a favorite anymore. Okay, this one. I don't glorify the night uh, like I did before when I was, you know, in my uh, when I was in my in my in my in my in my twenties, my twenties. So. Understood. Okay, last one. Yeah. Altered states or altered carbon. Altered states. Yes. Do you know that? What's altered state? I mean, no, I don't know it. What is it? It's a nineteen. I mean, generally, I'd have to say, even without knowing that, I would always say altered carbon. <laughs> altered, you elaborate? altered states is a nineteen eighty uh, movie, kind kind of like a, a horror sci fi movie starring William Hurt. It's a great movie. Check oh. it out. Oh, I will. Thank you so much. Now you've given me some homework. That's good, but it's yeah. cultural homework. So. I'm gonna put I'm gonna I'm gonna put that on my on my to watch list. Yeah, altered. As much as I hope that you're putting all the carbon season two on your to watch list. Are you Are you kidding? Please, I've seen season one two times. I'm I am I am going awesome. to be binging season two. Great! It's such an it's such an exciting show to watch. And what if if you have only half as much fun watching it as like. I enjoy making it on a scale from one to ten. You have eleven fun. I can promise that. What I, what I find so genius about the show is that each season, the same character names can be there, but different actors in different embodiments. Yeah, exactly. And it's interesting. It's so interesting to see that if you're familiar with um, with um, the first embodiment of uh, of Dragon uh, Kovac by Joe Kinnaman to see um, Anthony Mackie's take on that is it's brilliant. It's really brilliant. Torben Liebrecht, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. And and that's and, it. And uh, to all your, all your listeners, keep up the good spirits and uh, all the best. Enjoy the show. And stay classy. I crossed the stars in a colony ship before stacks were invented. I left a dying earth behind to see the new world. Mr. Kovach. I know what you dream of. Your resleeving is now complete. This book designed by Kamalo Bioware. Military use only. Rapid healing, enhanced reaction time, among other bells and whistles. Oh my. Of all the godforsaken rocks we've been to, we're right back where we started. Harlan's War? Thought you swore you'd never return. What compelled you? I'm still looking for her, and I can't walk away. That's not love. It's obsession. In time, even love turns to dust. Talk. Whatever you need, whatever it costs, cut out 
their stacks and bring them to me. The whole planet's going to be hunting him. We're in danger here. Oh, I assure you. Measures will be taken. I can destroy you so utterly nothing will be left. I've heard that one before. Activate Evergreen. Confirm. Are you so far gone you don't recognize yourself? How does it feel to be afraid of death again? Or is this your first time? My name is Charles Officer, and I'm the writer and director of Invisible Essence, The Little Prince. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara on CIUT 89.5 FM. Hi, my name is Joanne Vanicola, and I'm an actor and a writer, and I was first on Rainbow Country with Mark Tara on CIUT 895-FM, discussing the massacre at Pulse Club in, in Orlando. Um, I realized how important it was for our community to have a radio station, uh, specifically for our issues, to, to talk about people in, in the LGBTQ community and to provide a, an outlet for our stories, um, to discuss uh, our politics, culture, and give voice to the to the issues that matter to us, um, and of course our artists and and um, the things that we do globally and right here in Toronto, and and talk about culture. And without people like Mark Tara providing a space for this with with a radio show like this, then uh, we wouldn't have that voice. So support, tune in. Thank you. Hi, this is Emily Saliers from Indigo Girls, and you're listening to Rainbow Country on CIUT 89.5 FM. Altered Carbon, Season 2, starring Anthony Mackie and Torben Liebrecht. From the hit Netflix series, drops globally Thursday, February 27th in 190 countries. To keep up to date with all things country, rainbow country, follow me on socials at Mark Tara Music. Do you have a guest suggestion, a show idea? Send me an email. Mark at marktara.com. The podcast for Rainbow Country is available wherever you get your favorite podcasts, and the official Rainbow Country playlist is out on Spotify. And of course, everything is hooked up at my website, marktara.com. Finally, I want to take this time to thank you for taking your time to be with me. Remember, we live in days of making dreams come true. So believe in yourself, and the world will believe in you. Hi, I'm Mary John Tory, and you're listening to CIUT 89.5 FM. Mm. 